Hello book lovers and welcome to Book Talk Radio Club. My name is Claire Perkins and today I'm talking to author Dr. April Lisbon. April has recently published her second book, Autism in April, A Mother's Journey During the Tween Years. This book is designed to encourage mothers of children with autism spectrum disorder, ASD, and other special needs to never give up hope and faith as they continue to endure the life-changing experiences associated with raising a child with special needs. Hi April, welcome and thank you for coming back on Book Talk Radio Club to talk with me. Thank you so much for having me on the air again once again, Claire. Sure. So, Autism in April covers the tween years of a child with autism. From what I gather, this can be a particularly fraught time, but how different is it to the tween years in a child without autism? You know, um, for me, for just from my own personal experience, um, of course, you know, you go through the different hormonal changes sure. and, um, you know, just children just trying to figure out who they are mm -hmm. um, as far as their bodies and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, um, just looking at it with a child with autism, um, one of the things that we seem to really struggle with during this part of our journey is um, the idea of friendships. What do friends look like? What does it mean to have a friend? Um, you know, bullying was very significant to this school year because um, the language um, mm. that a lot of kids in that preteen team use, mm. um, my son really struggled to comprehend. Um, he ended up being almost like the butt of people's jokes, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and um, he didn't get it. And so people who he thought were friends of his actually turned against him. Um, and so, you know, trying to understand, you know, why is this person um, treating me this way, right. um, you know, was a struggle for sure. him. Sure. Um, you know, of course, hygiene is a big issue <laughs> with all teens. Um, but I think with 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 kids with autism, mm. um, I think it's very difficult to, to rationalize with them as to the value and the importance of um, of being clean. With my son, um, some of it was still very sensory in nature. Um, some of it was because he had found himself in a depressed state that he didn't want to, um, you know, to be clean. And, you know, he could care less if anyone um, even smelled him or not. Right. You know? And I'm just thinking to my, and most, you know, most kids in that tween years, you know, after a couple of days of not washing, you know, eventually they will do it. But um, that wasn't where he was um, in that process. Um, disciplining as far as, you know, um, just trying to rationalize with him mm. um, was a lot, has been very challenging in comparison to where he was when he was younger. Right. Um, you know, just because he's always on edge. And what I mean by that is that his anxiety level is seems to be um, on high all the time, right. which which wasn't the same when he was in, when he wasn't the same when he was younger. Right. Um, and I think a lot of that just has to do with not understanding what's the changes that's happening within his body, sure. um, not understanding, you know, how people who once upon a time seem to like me no longer like me, and just trying to, um, you know, really find his own identity. And that's very difficult for kids on the spectrum, you mm. know, whereas the other kids, you know, they have the little clicks, they have the little friends. Mm. You know, kids with the spectrum, because they are... Um, socially awkward, um, they really struggle to fit in and, I, and find an identity for themselves. And so that's what I really noticed was the marked change, um, you know, from my neurotypical tween to my child on the spectrum. Your book is designed to encourage mothers of children with autism spectrum disorder, ASD, and other special needs to never give up hope and faith as they continue to endure the life-changing experiences associated with raising a child with special needs. What is the hardest part of raising a child that, that's on the autism spectrum? I mean, for, for, you know, from any age, I'm talking just about tweens. Right. Um, you know what? The hardest thing is that um, I don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. Right. So, you know, with kids on the spectrum, um, like I said before, their perception of the world, themselves and people shifts can shift every day, can shift moment by moment. And, you know, some things um, that may have worked um, the week prior to no longer works. Um, and that has been hard for me. I bet. Because, because typically, 
basically, you know, our biggest thing um, that we've always used to utilize was um, the zones of regulations. And basically, it's just a tool that helps my son um, to identify his feelings when he can't use words. Right. So rather than using words, he identifies the color. All right, the blue zone, the red zone, et cetera. Clever. Uh, during the tween years, what I have found is that um, even using something as simple as the zones of regulations can set him off. Um, simply because he's to that he's in that point and in that place where like I said, he's trying to secure his independence, mm -hmm. but his mom, because I understand the autism journey um, professionally and just talking to other autism moms, I find myself smothering him, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because I'm trying to protect him from the disability, yeah. but I realize that I'm doing more harm than good. And so here you have... Um, this child who's trying to bloom, you know, in the cracks of, of being on the autism spectrum mm. and me trying to keep the crack filled so that he doesn't have to um, experience all the pressures. You're a school... So, oh, sorry, go on, carry on. Thank you. Yes. So, you know, so for us, I think that's, that's the hardest part is just, you know, not knowing what works from one day to the next mm. and not trying to smother him. You're a school psychologist and a mother of a son with autism, as we've found out, and you chose to write Autism in April from a mother's perspective rather than from a professional perspective. Why was that? Um, you know what? That that was that was a little bit harder because I had to be authentic. Um, and what I mean by that is that as I wrote that book, I literally I couldn't fall back on my role as a school psychologist and try to rationalize right. on things that were happening in the book. Mm. I really had to deal with it head on, which was hard because while I was writing that book, um, every chapter was based on um, a moment in time that we had experienced. Right. Um, the latter part of the book, we were actually going through it and I was writing the book simultaneously, <laughs> those chapters. Um, you know, of the book. And that was very hard because, you know, I didn't know what would happen next. You right. know? Um, I didn't know how it would be handled next. I just knew that I needed to get it out yeah. so that it wouldn't consume me any longer. So I think from that perspective, you know, it was much harder writing it from the perspective of his mom yeah. because, um, you know, we were we were right there in the middle. It wasn't like, you know, I could fall back on theory and books yeah. to help save me in writing. It was yeah. like, no, you have to get this out. Well, you're going to crack and fall. You yeah. won't be any good to yourself or your child. You couldn't detach yourself. I could not. No, I can imagine. I mean, the second part of the book chronicles your son's journey and, uh, and as he shares his feelings with you, which I think is actually a brilliant idea. So not only does the reader get a mum's perspective, but also the child's perspective too, the, ch the tween's perspective. Sorry, I can't get my teeth in. Perspective too. <laughs> Tell me about some of his experiences then. Um... You know, it's, it's, it's weird. <laughs> um, and, and like I said, I think the, the one that was so exciting for me and for most moms, um, that was when he finally found his first girlfriend. And, you know, it was kind of interesting because when you read about um, individuals, you know, autistic individuals, one of the things that we all know, they are socially awkward. Mm. So I never thought that my son would find a girlfriend. No, you know what they said, there's a pot for every lid. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So when he told me about his girlfriend, and, you know, it was the cutest story. He was like, but well, mom, we just go to class, but we never kiss. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. My baby has a girlfriend. You know, because he's, he's breaking all of those stereotypes, you right. know, that I know about people on the spectrum. Sure. Sure. So, you know, so I was really excited about that. And then one day he told me he came home and he broke up with her. And I was like, what? <laughs> well, he's just doing, he's just doing regular teens, tween teen stuff, isn't he? <laughs> exactly. I'm like, why did you break up with her? And he was like, and he basically said, because she was rude to the teacher. And I'm thinking to myself, so what? You got a girlfriend. <laughs> You know, but because she failed to follow the rules, absolutely. You need to be with her. No, absolutely. As a mum going through your son's tween years, what kind of support do you receive? I mean, do you think there's enough support for parents with special needs children? 
you know, um, I would, that's a yes and no question. <laughs> All right, well, give me the yes and no answers then. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that. I will say yes, depending on the types of disability your child has, there are a lot of supports and services out there from birth to adulthood. But from my personal experience, there is limited resources for individuals with developmental disabilities like autism. Um, I can tell you that, for example, you know, doing a part of that journey within that book, my son was having some, some serious issues with bullying. And so, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do to get him was what we call ABA or applied behavior analysis. Mm. When I called my insurance company, they basically told me, well, he's too old, um, you know, to receive these services. And I'm thinking to myself, but his behaviors are significant. The, aut the autism has never gone away. Mm. How in the world can you age out of services? Yeah. I, you know, th that boggled my mind. Yeah. You know, thinking to myself, so your cutoff is this age, and my child, who still has a disability, mm. can't even get these services. So what I have found, which is very, um, you know, gut-wrenching, is that, you know, the, the, the types and the quality of services for people on the spectrum are very limited. Um, once they, it seems like depending on your insurance company, once they get, um, beyond age 10, yeah. the resources are much less than when they're younger. Right. You know? mm. And, you know, and like I said, that's, that's heart wrenching, you know, because the disability is. never goes anyway, sure. anywhere. The behaviors are always there. They're just older. And then you're telling me that my child can get services. So that's where that no part comes in. Right. Um, no, there are limited resources, you know, for my son, unless I were to pay for private practice. And mm. when I think about these services, you know, through private practice, they're astronomical, sure. you know. And so it's so that's why I said yes and no. So if he had another disability, he probably would be getting more services. <laughs> but because it's autism and they're still trying to, you know, insurance companies are still trying to understand what autism is all about. Yeah. It is very difficult for them to um to basically provide the right resources for families. So, yes, it's been a challenge, especially during the tween years, to find resources for our family. We're not given a how-to manual for raising a child, and we're certainly not born knowing how to. I mean, generally, we use this, the example of how we were raised ourselves. But you say nothing prepares a parent when it comes to raising a child with autism. I mean, if there was a manual for this, if there were a manual for this, would it help? I mean, each child is different and each parent is different. How do we know how we're going to react to any given situation? You know, um, <laughs> you, you, we don't. Um, but I think, I think if I knew, if I had a crystal ball mm. and I knew what to expect, I could better prepare myself for it. Mm. Um, for example, um, and this isn't in this particular book because this happened a couple of months after the book was written. But one of the things that I did not know was that individuals, um, autistic individuals, especially those with higher functioning autism, um, are highly suicidal. I didn't know that until we actually experienced it in my own household with my own son. Um, never learned it in theory, um, never had any materials on it, mm. even when I contacted the national suicide hotline, mm. um, they really didn't even have any resources for me. And so, you know, just thinking through that process, if I had a manual that would have told me, hey, April, this is something that you want to be mindful about. Yeah. I probably would have done a better, a better job of getting my son counseling services. Right. Um, beforehand, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, you know, because it, like I said, that was, that was a very scary period within our life. And like I said, not knowing that information, not having other parents of children with autism um, to share this with me, um, I wasn't prepared. Sure. You know, not prepared me for that. So, yeah. So I do wish I had a manual if it existed, but I think from the vantage point of almost like what to expect if you have a child that's on the spectrum, that's what I need. <laughs> I think a lot of parents could use that as well. Your first book, Stretch Thin, uh, chronicles your journey as a social justice advocate for children that have been identified for special educational services. Would you like to tell Book Talk Radio Club's listeners about Stretch Thin? 
Absolutely. Um, so with that particular book stretch then, Finding Balance, Working and Parenting Children with Special Needs, that basically just chronicles my journey as social just, a social justice advocate for children with disabilities and my role as of a school psychologist. Right. And how I've always supported children, you know, and their families and educators throughout their journey. Um, however, it was not until I became that parent that I really realized, you know, what it meant to raise a child or children with special needs. Um, and so, you know, trying to come to grips with, um, you know, will my own children receive the exact same support and quality of services yeah. that I've given to other children, you know, has always been in the back of my mind. And in that process, it goes through, you know, the cycle of grief that I went through, you know, hearing the hear the, the, the diagnosis for my children and, you know, not wanting to believe it, not wanting to accept it. And then finally coming to a point where, you know, this is our life and, you know, this is what we have to deal with. So really that's what it is. And, and just understanding that, you know, we have to take time for ourselves if we want to be the best parent, um, the best worker and the mm. best advocate for our children. And like I said, I did not come to that point until you know my son was actually 10 years old so it took me several years to get to that point where I realized that if I wanted to be the best advocate for him and the other children that I serve that I had to take care of myself first. Absolutely I love the dedication of the front of stretch thing it reads this book is dedicated to my amazing sons who taught me to love life even in the face of adversity mommy loves you both I'm gonna start crying in a minute <laughs> how, how have they taught you to love life April? You know, um, I'm trying not to cry, so I won't. Um, <laughs> with my boys, I will tell you, they are the most loving kids. Um, you know, they support people even when people treat them cruelly. Um, you know, and, and they know that they're different. Mm. And even though they know that they're different, they always try to ensure that other people don't feel different, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that just kind of sort of watching their journeys, excluding, you know, typical sibling, you know, rivalry, sure. but just watching how um, they protect each other, yeah. um, watching how, you know, how when they come home and they see one of their friends hurting or another child hurting, um, you know, how they hurt too and how they want to go back and support the, the, you know, the kids who may be hurting. It just helps me to realize two things. One we have to be flexible with ourselves and with our emotions mm. and understand that we have to be good to ourselves if we want to support other people. Absolutely. And two, it also helped me to realize that it's okay to be different. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be like everyone else in order for people to like you. Mm. And, and like I said, you know, that, that really helped me to understand that, you know, even, even someone like myself who in my younger years struggled with low self-esteem and things of that nature, I hated being different. But watching my children go through their journeys with their different disabilities and being accepting of their differences, it helped me to realize that, one, I had a lot of growing to do, but two, I could love myself even in being different. So yes. Exactly. I see from your bio that you've also contributed material for other books and written several articles related to issues in special education. Do you intend to carry on writing and publishing books about rearing children that are on the um, autism spectrum? You know what, Claire? I will be honest with you. I thought Stretch Thin was going to be my last book. Um, <laughs> really? I've been focusing on, on um, you know, just not only working with children with special needs, but even the idea of autism. Mm. Um, because I was in a place where um, I still didn't want to be identified as an autism mom. Right. But after writing um, the second book, um, Autism in April, I realized that, you know, that's a special niche and a voice that needs to be heard. Yes. Because, um, the rise in autism is increasing every single year. Mm -hmm. And a lot of parents need to know that there are other people like them out there. Yes. Yeah. So, yes, I am going to continue to make that uh, my primary focus. Um, once again, if the books will still be applicable to, to typical um, children, children with other disabilities. But, yes, my focus will continue to be on, um, you know, families raising children with autism. One, because it's a journey that I know 
And two, like I said, it's a voice that has been hidden for so long. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time that we come out um, into the spotlight and let people know that we're here and that we need supports and services, um, just like any other parent with a child with disability. So, yes. You're already receiving great reviews for both books, including Excellent Read, This Book Tells It Like It Is, Well Worth the Time, and the author is so real in describing what it is like to be the parent fighting for a child's future. I mean, well done, April. To help other people that are struggling is indeed a blessing. So where can Book Talk Radio Club's listeners purchase Autism in April and Stretch Thin? Um, you can actually purchase both books on Amazon mm -hmm. as, well as, as well as Barnes & Noble. Right, that's lovely. All right, well, thank you, April. Please come back on Book Talk Radio Club again. I'd love to chat with you and hear more. In the meantime, good luck for the future, and thank you, everyone, for listening to Book Talk Radio Club. Thank you, April. Thank you once again for having me on, Claire. Sure. Hang on.